I, I welcome this presentation as a further excuse um, to stray from the manuscript of the book, um, but I hope that it will enrich it when I return to it. Abraham de la Pena was 34 when he arrived at Birkenau, most likely either on April 7th or May 21st, 1944, in a transport of Dutch Jews from Westerbork. 21 years later, on March 26th, 1965, he flew from Amsterdam to Frankfurt to testify against Dr. Franz Lucas, the man he claimed had selected him on the ramp for hard labor. The court did not require de la Pena's testimony to get Lucas to confess, because Lucas had already done that two weeks earlier but only after 15 months of denial. On the basis of fellow defendant Stefan Beretsky's accusation after, and after verbal and written salvos between adjunct prosecutor Christian Raabe and Lucas's lawyer Rudolf Aschenauer, Lucas had finally conceded on March 11, 1965 to selecting three or four times on the ramp under duress. De La Pena's testimony was now necessarily only to undergird the indictment, but his 44 minutes on the witness stand resulted instead in self-sabotage. Beyond confusing the facts, his miscue was chiefly his failure to identify Lucas, the defendant who even after his partial confession claimed the most exculpatory witnesses of the 20 men on trial. To the court, De La Pena's performance was emblematic of testimonies undermined by the tiring logistics of travel, indifferent, indifferent reception, language difficulties, popular demands that a Schlussstrich be drawn under post-war justice, and general rudeness from defense attorneys. Helen Goldman, who had testified against Lucas already in September 1964, was an uncanny predecessor for De La Pena. She broke down under pressure after claiming that Lucas had selected her for kitchen duty but had gassed her mother and siblings. Otto Dov Kolke, by contrast, exemplified the advice given by Hermann Langbein, a privileged prisoner and model key witness, that in order to better support the indictments, witnesses should avoid unnecessary subjectivity. In July 1964, Kolke described the selection styles of Mengele and Lucas as he remembered witnessing them when he was 11 years old. Both Goldman, and Kolka identified Lucas in the courtroom when prompted by the judge for a lineup. Kolka even addressed Lucas quietly, asked him, asking him as he looked up to him whether he remembered watching the performances the youth put on in the youth camp. But when De La Pena's turn came in March of 1965, he failed to identify Lucas from the lineup and became instead the proof for how the shortfall of evidence and credibility opens up this dilemma described by Lyotard. If there is nobody to adduce the proof, nobody to admit it, and if the argument which upholds it is judged to be absurd, then the plaintiff is dismissed. The wrong he or she complains of cannot be attested. He or she becomes a victim. De La Pena's blunders on identification and forensic details blinded the court to the ways that he could testify truthfully, but since we are making non-juridical judgments, we should not degrade his testimony by removing it from it happened this way to consign it to I remember it this way. Rather, we ought to reassess testimony in the context of other testimonies and historical <coughs> discourses that may or may not have achieved archival status. My aim here is to validate adjunct prosecutor Christian Rabe's hunch, a mark of his status as model listener, to borrow from the um, the model from yesterday, the model reader, that De La Pena brought authentic proof against Lucas, and to do so by addressing concrete grievances, the dynamic of identification, and the effect of untruth on the credibility of both accuser and accused. After all, there is a difference between a plaintiff's misremembered facts and the deceptive facts that a defendant and his attorney offer. What are De La Pena's grievances? Primarily two primary beatings by SS thugs, and two selections carried out by Dr. Lucas. De La Pena volunteered to testify against Lucas after recognizing his name from a television special on December 19, 1964, about the Auschwitz site inspection that the court delegation had undertaken a few days earlier. Lucas had been the sole defendant, still free and shameless enough to make the trip. De La Pena gave a statement to the Amsterdam police on January 25th, 
1965. In court, he reported in March that two punishments were responsible for the pain still afflicting him. The first came during one of his 12-hour shifts in the munitions factory, after his broken machine produced only 10 grenade heads instead of 200. The 20 lashes he received from an electric cable for this sudden drop in production made him unable to lie on his back for three months. The second punishment came in July or August of 1944 after he stumbled against an SS man who then kicked him and forced him to roll on the ground for several meters, 200 or 300. The pain was so great he entered the hospital with a fever. He was black and blue from the beatings. After three days in the temporary hospital in block nine or 10, he heard a block elder discuss an impending hospital selection. Two SS prisoners from Riga uh, were also convalescing, and when word came that Lukas would be the selecting doctor, one told the other that they had nothing to fear. It was Dr. Lukas, after all. When Lukas arrived, De La Pena recognized him as the doctor who had selected him upon his arrival at Birkenau. He thus fought his way to the back of the barracks, standing with arms raised in a group of five while numbers were recorded. Two days later, he reports that two trucks arrived to take 150 prisoners to the gas chamber. Although his descriptions of his wounds and the two selections he underwent sounded credible, the problem was that De La Pena failed to describe his victimizer. He insisted, Ich kann es Ihnen nicht mehr erzählen. I really can't tell you that anymore. Because two sightings of Lucas were insufficient for recalling physical features. De La Pena had recognized only the name, not the face, from the television footage of Lucas. His statement, he said, had come so late in the trial because he was not interested in following the coverage. I've gone through so much misery, I have no desire to read about it or watch it, he said. But on the 19th of December of 64, he happened to be watching the news with an acquaintance. Hearing Lucas's name made him weep to the extent that he needed someone's help to write a letter. But now he regretted coming forward because clearly his testimony had harmed him more than it had helped the court. So after failing to describe the way Lucas looked, De La Pena drew grief for his inability to pronounce the U in Lucas. After being lectured to by the court, he condescended to pronounce it correctly, insisting that in Dutch he could only say Lucas. If he was willing to affront the German umlaut, the defense seemed to suggest, how could one trust the rest of his account? The third strike against De La Pena was the worst. As I mentioned, it was the visual test. It was a kind of reverse selection that brought more pressure than vindication. De La Pena pointed at the defendant standing next to Lucas. He acknowledged not having recognized Lucas in the newspaper or television footage either due to the civilian clothes that Lucas was wearing and the span of 20 years that had passed. De La Pena's strikeout was a victory for Aschenauer, the defense attorney, since discrediting, discrediting the witness through basic identification failure delayed the real questions worth asking. But now Aschenauer even questioned whether De La Pena was the prisoner he claimed to be. For De La Pena to have been deported in April 1944 meant that he could not have received the number A2744 because it was given to a Belgian Jew who arrived on a transport from Malin on May 21st of 44. Furthermore, numbers beginning with A only went to effect after May 13. To believe Aschenauer, if De La Pena could neither identify Lucas nor substantiate his own camp identity, his motive for appearing in court must have been one of revenge, a natural step after having sought compensation. <coughs> De La Pena's court performance looked a lot like an audition for which he was woefully unprepared. He blamed his blurred responses increasingly on nervousness. He declined to show on a map where the prisoners went after being beaten out of the trains, claiming a poor memory. He was also irritable. I've already explained that. I said that already. I won't take that back. These retorts sounded even more desperate by the time Aschenauer challenged him on his tattoo. Then you're wrong. If you say that it's different, then I must not know anything about the whole thing. Or you're really misinformed. These rough edges, in my view, were simply authentic proof of conveying the truth to an audience decidedly disenthralled about hearing it. Upon swearing in, he had insisted his statement be taken seriously and not used for sensational ends. 
because he was offering a testimony bought at even more of a cost to his well-being, he seemed to consider the forensic questions he received interruptive of his own narrative. Still, he was not so focused on his own story as to miss retorting a lie to Lucas's denial, which was prompted by a question from Judge Hofmeyer, of performing the hospital selections. This rejoinder, a lie, echoed the claim given by Lucas's co-defendant, Stefan Beretsky, two weeks earlier, that Lucas was telling a lie when he denied performing the ramp selections. And this, a lie, was the occasion for state attorney Joachim Kugler to personally rebuke Lucas for lying to him, Kugler, for so many months about ramp selections. The court had just heard Wilhelm Bogart's partial confession two days before De La Pena appeared. So the late confessions of both Lucas and Bogart gave adjunct prosecutor Henry Ormond reason in his closing arguments to consider every answer of defendants untrustworthy, including the confessions themselves. Given their pattern of deception, what else were the defendants holding back? Nevertheless, if the prosecution could not trust Lucas because of his 15 months of denial that were finally exposed as deception, the court could scarcely trust De La Pena after his inability to identify his victimizer or to even prove he was the victim he said he was. De La Pena intended his testimony to outweigh the lies the court was hearing from Lucas. He was there and he experienced it. He was exploding the secret that the Camp SS had tried to exterminate through its evacuation of Auschwitz in January of 45. He said, I, I haven't come here to lie. I've come here to explain what I know. And what I know, I've told you. I can't say anything more about it. It would be a mistake to attribute his stubbornness and his tone to desperation under pressure because it is consistent with his deposition of January 25th which had shown a similar insistence <coughs> to overturn lies with facts. If this man maintains during the trial that he never engaged in autonomous selections, then he's lying, because I experienced it twice, as I mentioned. And here's where I want to talk a little bit about Christian Rabe's attentiveness as the model listener. Not in the sense that Eichmann was listening to his witnesses without looking them in the face. This is a more beneficial way of listening. While De La Pena was asserting his truthfulness, Christian Raba was trying to coax it out of him more naturally. He asked why De La Pena was claiming now in court to have rec recognized Lucas on television in December 1964 only by name when his deposition in January 1965 in indicated he had also recognized Lucas by sight. De La Pena attributed the error to being af affected by two calamities during the week of the television footage. He had not only witnessed his son die, he had also lost a kidney. His statement in court now, he assured Rabe, was the correct and intractable one. Rabe accepted the explanation and encouraged the court to accept it likewise under the circumstances. But Rabe showed the most po poignant attentiveness when he asked De La Pena to speak through an interpreter instead of speaking German that Rabe and the court found difficult to understand. Your statement is really important. Please speak it more slowly in Dutch to enable the interpreter to translate it for us. A simple enough thing to call De La Pena's statement important, but powerful enough to turn anxiety into some sort of dignity. Rabe ultimately reached a different conclusion than the court, as his closing remarks in May of 1965 indicate, where he said, the witness who is a simple manual laborer made on the whole a trustworthy impression on me. And he could understand how agitation produced um, De La Pena's imprecision. And he ventured that a testimony that contained minor contradictions was more authentic than one that sounded rehearsed. <coughs> My conclusion paragraph here is that we can sum up De La Pena's reception in Frankfurt by saying that he underwent a second humiliation, both of person and testimony, 20 years after hearing daily in so many words and in the same language that his dignity meant nothing. At the courthouse, a doorman put him in a room with 10 former SS men waiting to be questioned. After two hours, a representative from the Red Cross apologized and brought him to another waiting room. When they tracked down his translator, finally she turned out to be Belgian. I'm not sure if that was a bad thing, but it seemed to be a bad thing for him. What chance did an amateur have in a domain of legal experts? 
De La Pena died two weeks after the trial concluded on August 20th of 1965. Cancer finished destroying with the camp injuries had started. A better example of Avishai and Margalit's moral witness is hard to find. De La Pena's legacy of injuries and misfortune testifies more articulately than any verbal response he could grant the court. And so to re reiterate, minor blunders and a major identification failure should not disqualify what De La Pena traveled to Frankfurt to say, especially considering the encumbrance he assumed by choosing to testify at a time when Lucas's good German aura was at its peak in the press. De La Pena was in danger of being run over by a bandwagon of exculpatory testimony derived mainly from Ravensbrück medical um, assistant survivors. It is no wonder his testimony unraveled under pressure, bound as his trauma was to fade more slowly, if at all, than any trustworthiness he could summon vis-a-vis -vis the court. The exception being his exemplary reception by Raaba and Henry Ormond, representing the joint plaintiffs. And there is much to recommend reconsidering accounts such as that of De La Pena that were deemed legally inadmissible. The invitation to do so increases with the availability of trial transcripts, especially in digital form, of linkages such as the International Tracing Service and among technologies and museums and scholars on a global scale. My own research angle argues for relocating some of the burden of proof from the victim to the perpetrator by careful readings against the grain of perpetrator narratives to whose earliest versions one should often give the most credence. Protocols from state attorney's offices may corroborate or overturn accounts. Documents landing in local and federal <coughs> archives will continue to close gaps between history and memory. And I could say more about um, the Ashnar's claim that certain camp numbers were only issued at certain times, um, but it's interesting to see that uh, the likely date was May 21st after all, and there's reason to believe that um, he did receive that number of A2744 because of the simultaneous arrival of a transport uh, from Westerbork and Malen. Um, however, there's reason to believe that Lucas was not on the ramp on May 21st. On May 20th, he had been granted a 10-day furlough to Osnabrück following the Allied bombing that leveled his family's house. So he was probably on the way home that day. It's all tricky terrain but worth the effort to see how much the lament of the Zeitzeuge lines up with the accusations of the Tatzeuge. It's worth giving soft evidence such as testimony the respect reserved too often per for perpetrator-generated evidence, especially when hard evidence is accidental, having been in intended for destruction along with the witnesses. The motivation for revisiting previously dismissed testimony thus re derives from a refusal to place a statute of limitations on genocide, and more precisely, from a determination in the name of justice to continue overturning disorder with order and restoring, restoring dignity to those robbed of it, as Hannah Arendt insisted shortly after herself witnessing the day of the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial. 